The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book 5 And now, as dawn rose from her couch besides Tithonus, harbinger of light alike to mortals and immortals, the gods met in council, and with them Jove the lord of thunder, who is their king. Thereon Minerva began to tell them of the many sufferings of Ulysses, for she pitied him away there in the house of the nymph Calypso. Father Jove, said she, and all you other gods that live in everlasting bliss, I hope there may never be such a thing as a kind and well-disposed ruler any more, nor one who will govern equitably. I hope they will all be henceforth cruel and unjust, for there is not one of his subjects but has forgotten Ulysses, who ruled them as though he were their father. There he is, lying in great pain, in an island where dwells the nymph Calypso, who will not let him go, and he cannot get back to his own country, for he can find other ships nor sailors to take him over the sea. Furthermore, wicked people are now trying to murder his only son, Telemachus, who is coming home from Elis and Lacedaemon, where he has been to see if he can get further news of his father. What, my dear, are you talking about? replied her father. Did you not send him there yourself, because you thought it would help Ulysses to get home and punish the suitors? Besides, you are perfectly able to protect Telemachus, and to see him safely home again. While the suitors have to come hurry, scurrying back without having killed him, when he had thus spoken, he said to his son Mercury, Mercury, you are our messenger. Go therefore and tell Calypso we have decreed that poor Ulysses is to return home. He is to be convoyed neither by gods nor men, but after a perilous voyage of twenty days upon a raft, he is to reach fertile Syria, the land of the Phaeacians who are near of kin to the gods, and will honor him as though he were one of ourselves. They will send him in a ship to his own country, and will give him more bronze and gold and raiment than he would have brought back from Troy, if he had had all his prize money and had got home without disaster. This is how we have settled that he shall return to his country and his friends. Thus he spoke, and Mercury guide and guardian, slayer of Argus, did as he was told. Forthwith he bound on his glittering golden sandals, with which he could fly like the wind over land and sea. He took the wand with which he seals men's eyes in sleep, or wakes them just as he pleases, and flew holding it in his hand over Pyria. Then he swooped down through the firmament till he reached the level of the sea, whose waves he skimmed like a cormorant that flies fishing every hole and corner of the ocean and drenching its thick plumage in the spray. He flew and flew over many a weary wave, but when, at last, he got to the island, which was his journey's end, he left the sea and went on by land till he came to the cave where the nymph Calypso lived. He found her at home. There was a large fire burning on the hearth, and one could smell from far the fragrant reek of burning cedar and sandalwood. As for herself, she was busy at her loom, shooting her golden shuttle through the warp and singing beautifully. Round her cave there was a thick wood of alder, poplar, and sweet-smelling cypress trees, wherein all kinds of great birds had built their nests, owls, hawks, and chattering sea-crows that occupy their business in the waters. A vine loaded with grapes was trained and grew luxuriantly about the mouth of the cave. There were also four running rills of water in channels cut pretty close together, and turned hither and thither so as to irrigate the beds of violets and luscious herbage over which they flowed. Even a god could not help being charmed with such a lovely spot. So Mercury stood still and looked at it. But when he had admired it sufficiently, he went inside the cave. Calypso knew him at once, a 
the gods all know each other, no matter how far they live from one another. But Ulysses was not within. He was on the seashore as usual, looking out upon the barren ocean, with tears in his eyes, groaning and breaking his heart for sorrow. Calypso gave Mercury a seat and said, Why have you come to see me, Mercury? Honored and ever welcome, for you do not visit me often. Say what you want, I will do it for you at once, if I can, and if it can be done at all. But come inside, and let me set refreshment before you. As she spoke, she drew a table loaded with ambrosia beside him, and mixed him some red nectar. So Mercury ate and drank till he had had enough, and then said, We are speaking God and goddess to one another, and you ask me why I have come here, and I will tell you truly, as you would have me do. Jove sent me. It was no doing of mine. Who could possibly want to come all this way over the sea, where there are no cities full of people to offer me sacrifices or choice hecatombs? Nevertheless, I had to come, for none of us other gods can cross Jove nor transgress his orders. He says that you have here the most ill-starred of all those who fought nine years before the city of King Priam and sailed home in the tenth year after having sacked it. On their way home they sinned against Minerva, who raised both wind and waves against them, so that all his brave companions perished, and he alone was carried hither by wind and died. Jove says that you are to let this man go at once, for it is decreed that he shall not perish here, far from his own people, but shall have returned to his house and country and see his friends again. Calypso trembled with rage when she heard this. You gods, she exclaimed ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You are always jealous and hate seeing a goddess take a fancy to a mortal man and live with him in open matrimony. So when rosy-fingered dawn made love to Orion, you precious gods were all of you furious till Diana went and killed him in Ortasia. So again, when Ceres fell in love with Aeacian and yielded to him in a thrice-plowed fallow field, Jove came to hear of it before so long and killed Aeacian with his thunderbolts. And now you are angry with me, too, because I have a man here. I found the poor creature sitting all alone astride of a keel, for Jove had struck his ship with lightning and sunk it in mid-ocean, so that all his crew were drowned, while he himself was driven by wind and waves on to my island. I got fond of him, and cherished him, and had set my heart on making him immortal, so that he should never grow old all his days. Still I cannot cross Jove, nor bring his counsels to nothing. Therefore, if he insists upon it, let the man go beyond the seas again. But I cannot send him anywhere myself, for I have neither ships nor men who can take him. Nevertheless, I will readily give him such advice in all good faith as will be likely to bring him safely to his own country. Then send him away, said Mercury, or Jove will be angry with you and punish you. On this he took his leave, and Calypso went out to look for Ulysses, for she had heard Jove's message. She found him sitting upon the beach, with his eyes ever filled with tears, and dying of sheer homesickness, for he had got tired of Calypso, and though he was forced to sleep with her in the cave by night, it was she, not he, that would have it so. As for the daytime, he spent it on the rocks and on the seashore, weeping, crying aloud for his despair, and always looking out upon the sea. Calypso then went close up to him and said, My poor fellow, you shall not stay here grieving and fretting your life out any longer. I am going to send you away of my own free will. So go, cut some beams of wood, and make yourself a large raft with an upper deck, that it may carry you safely over the sea. I will put bread, wine, and water on board to save you from starving. I will also give you clothes, and will send you a fair wind to take you home, if the gods in heaven so will it, for they know more about these things, and can settle them better than I can. Ulysses shuddered as he heard her. Now, goddess, he answered, there is something behind all this. You cannot be really meaning to help me home when you bid me do such a dreadful thing as put to sea on a raft. Not even a well-found ship with a fair wind could venture on such a distant voyage. Nothing that you can say or do. 
so make me go on board a raft unless you first solemnly swear that you mean me no mischief calypso smiled at this and caressed him with her hand you know a great deal said she but you are quite wrong here may heaven above and earth below be my witnesses with the waters of the river styx and this is the most solemn oath which a blessed god can take that i mean you no sort of harm and am only advising you to do exactly what i should do myself in your place i am dealing with you quite straightforwardly my heart is not made of iron and i am very sorry for you when she had thus spoken she led the way rapidly before him and ulysses followed in her steps so the pair goddess and man went on and on till they came to calypso's cave where ulysses took the seat that mercury had just left calypso set meat and drink before him of the food that mortals eat but her maids brought ambrosia and nectar for herself and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them when they had satisfied themselves with meat and drink calypso spoke saying ulysses noble son of laertes so you would start home to your own land at once good luck go with you but if you could only know how much suffering is in store for you before you get back to your own country you would stay where you are keep house along with me and let me make you immortal no matter how anxious you may be to see this wife of yours of whom you are thinking all the time day after day yet i flatter myself that i am no whit less tall or well-looking than she is for it is not to be expected that a mortal woman should compare in beauty with an immortal goddess replied ulysses do not be angry with me about this i am quite aware that my wife penelope is nothing like so tall or so beautiful as yourself she is only a woman whereas you are an immortal nevertheless i want to get home and can think of nothing else if some god wrecks me when i am on the sea i will bear it and make the best of it i have had infinite trouble both by land and sea already so let this go with the rest presently the sun set and it became dark whereon the bear retired into the inner part of the cave and went to bed when the child of morning rosy-fingered dawn appeared ulysses put on his shirt and cloak while the goddess wore a dress of a light gossamer fabric very fine and graceful with a beautiful golden girdle about her waist and a veil to cover her head she at once set herself to think how she could speed ulysses on his way so she gave him a great bronze axe that suited his hands it was sharpened on both sides and had a beautiful olive wood handle fitted firmly on to it she also gave him a sharp adze and then led the way to the far end of the island where the largest trees grow alder poplar and pine that reached the sky very dry and well seasoned so as to sail light for him in the water then when she had shown him where the best trees grow calypso went home leaving him to cut them which he soon finished doing he cut down twenty trees in all and adds them smooth squaring them by rule in good workmanlike fashion meanwhile calypso came back with some augers so he bore holes with them and fitted the timbers together with bolts and rivets he made the raft as broad as a skilled shipwright makes the beam of a large vessel and he filed a deck on top of the ribs and ran a gunwale all around it he also made a mast of yardarm and a rudder to steer with he fenced the raft all round with wicker hurdles as a protection against the waves and then he threw on a quantity of wood by and by calypso brought him some linen to make the sails and he made these too excellently making them fast with braces and sheets last of all with the help of levers he drew the raft down into the water in four days he had completed the whole work and on the fifth calypso sent him from the island after washing him and giving him some clean clothes she gave him a goat-skin full of black wine and another larger one of water she also gave him a wallet full of provisions and found him much good meat moreover she made the wind fair and warm for him and gladly did ulysses spread his sail before it while he sat and guided the raft skilfully by means of the rudder he never closed his eyes but kept them fixed on the pleiades on late setting boots and on the bear which men also called the wain and which turns round and round where it is facing orion 
and alone never dipping into the stream of Oceanus, for Calypso had told him to keep this to his left. Days seven and ten did he sail over the sea, and on the eighteenth the dim outlines of the mountains on the nearest part of the Phaeacian coast appeared, rising like a shield on the horizon. But King Neptune, who was returning from the Ethiopians, caught sight of Ulysses a long way off from the mountains of the Salome. He could see him sailing upon the sea, and it made him very angry. So he wagged his head and muttered to himself, saying, Heavens, so the gods have been changing their minds about Ulysses while I was away in Ethiopia. And now he is close to the land of the Phaeacians, where it is decreed that he shall escape from the calamities that have befallen him, till he shall have plenty of hardship yet before he has done with it. Thereon he gathered his clouds together, grasped his trident, turned it round in the sea, and roused the rage of every wind that blows till earth, sea and sky were hidden in cloud, and night sprang forth out of the heavens. Winds from east, south, north, and west fell upon him all at the same time, and a tremendous sea got up, so that Ulysses' heart began to fail him. Alas, he said to himself in his dismay, whatever will become of me. I am afraid Calypso was right when she said I should have trouble by sea before I got back home. It is all coming true. How black is Jove making heaven with his clouds, and what a sea the winds are raising from every quarter at once. I am now safe to perish. Blessed and thrice blessed were those Danans who fell before Troy in the cause of the sons of Atreus. Would that had been killed on the day when the Trojans were pressing me so sorely about the dead body of Achilles, for then I should have had due burial, and the Achaeans would have honoured my name. But now it seems that I shall come to a most pitiable end. As he spoke, a sea broke over him with such terrific fury that the raft reeled again, and he was carried overboard a long way off. He let go the helm and the force of the hurricane was so great that it broke the mast halfway up, and both sail and yard went over into the sea. For a long time Ulysses was under water, and it was all he could do to rise to the surface again, for the clothes Calypso had given him weighed him down. But at last he got his head above water and spat out the bitter brine that was running down his face in streams. In spite of all this, however, he did not lose sight of his raft but swam as fast as he could towards it got hold of it and climbed on board again so as to escape drowning the sea took the raft and tossed it about as autumn winds whirled thistle down round and round upon a road it was as though the south north east and west winds were all playing battledore and shuttlecock with it at once When he was in this plight, Eno, daughter of Cadmus, also called Leucothea, saw him. She had formerly been a mere mortal, but had been since raised to the rank of a marine goddess. Seeing in what great distress Ulysses now was, she had compassion upon him, and rising like a seagull from the waves, took her seat upon the raft. My poor good man, said she, why is Neptune so furiously angry with you? He is giving you a great deal of trouble, but for all his bluster he will not kill you. You seem to be a sensible person. Do then as I bid you. Strip, leave your off to drive before the wind, and swim to the Phaeacian coast where better luck awaits you. And here, take my veil and put it round your chest. It is enchanted, and you can come to no harm so long as you wear it. As soon as you touch land, take it off. Throw it back as far as you can into the sea, and then go away again. With these words, she took off her veil and gave it to him. Then she dived down again like a seagull and vanished beneath the dark blue waters. But Ulysses did not know what to think. Alas, he said to himself in his dismay, this is only some one or other of the gods who is luring me to ruin by advising me to quit my raft. At any rate, I will not do so at present, for the land where she said I should be quit of all troubles seemed to be still a good way off. I know what I will do. 
I am sure it will be best, no matter what happens. I will stick to the raft, as long as her timbers hold together, but when the sea breaks her up, I will swim for it. I do not see how I can do any better than this. While he was thus in two minds, Neptune sent a terrible great wave that seemed to rear itself above his head, till it broke right over the raft, which then went to pieces as though it were a heap of dry chaff tossed about by a whirlwind. Ulysses got astride of one plank and rode upon it, as if he were on horseback. He then took off the clothes Calypso had given him, bound Eno's veil under his arms, and plunged into the sea, meaning to swim on shore. King Neptune watched him as he did so, and wagged his head, muttering to himself, and saying, There now, swim up and down, as you best can, till you fall in with the well-to-do people. I do not think you will be able to say that I have let you off too lightly. On this he lashed his horses, and drove to Aegea, where his palace is. But Minerva resolved to help Ulysses, so she bound the ways of all the winds except one, and made them lie quite still. But she roused a good stiff breeze from the north, that should lay the waters till Ulysses reached the land of the Phaeacians, where he would be safe. Thereon he floated about for two nights and two days in the water, with a heavy swell on the sea, and death staring him in the face. But when the third day broke, the wind fell, and there was a dead calm without so much as a breath of air stirring. As he rose on the swell, he looked eagerly ahead, and could see land quite near. Then, as children rejoice when their dear father begins to get better, after having for a long time borne sore affliction, sent him by some angry spirit, but the gods deliver him from evil. So was Ulysses thankful when he again saw land and trees, and swam on with all his strength, that he might once more set foot upon dry ground. When, however, he got within earshot, he began to hear the surf thundering up against the rock, for the swell still broke against them with a terrific roar. Everything was enveloped in spray. There were no harbors where a ship might ride, nor shelter of any kind but only headlands, low-lying rocks, and mountain top. Ulysses' art now began to fail him, and he said despairingly to himself, Alas, Jove has let me see land after swimming so far that I had given up all hope, but I can find no landing place, for the coast is rocky and surf-beaten. The rocks are smooth and rise sheer from the sea, with deep water close under them, so that I cannot climb out for want of foothold. I am afraid some great wave will lift me off my legs and dash me against the rocks as I leave the water, which would give me a sorry landing. If, on the other hand, I swam further in search of some shelving beach or harbor, a hurricane may carry me out to sea again, sorely against my will, or heaven may send some great monster of the deep to attack me, for Amphitrite breeds many such, and I know that Neptune is very angry with me. While he was thus in two minds, a wave caught him and took him with such force against the rocks that he would have been smashed and torn to pieces if Minerva had not shown him what to do. He caught hold of the rock with both hands and clung to it, groaning with pain, till the wave retired. So he was saved that time. But presently the wave came on again and carried him back with it, far into the sea, tearing his hands as the suckers of a polypus are torn when some one plucks it from its bed, and the stones come up along with it. Even so did the rocks tear the skin from his strong hands, and then the wave drew him deep down under the water. Here poor Ulysses would have certainly perished, even in spite of his own destiny, if Minerva had not helped him to keep his wits about him. He swam seaward again, beyond reach of the surf that was beating against the land, and at the same time he kept looking towards the shore to see if he could find some haven, or a spit that should take the waves aslant. By and by, as he swam on, he came to the mouth of a river, and here he thought would be the best place, for there were no rocks, and it afforded shelter from the wind. He felt that there was a current, so he prayed inwardly, and said, Hear me, O king! whoever you may be, and save me from the anger of the sea-god Neptune, for I approach you prayerfully. Anyone who has lost his way has at all times a claim even upon the gods, 
wherefore in my distress i draw near to your stream and cling to the knees of your river bed have mercy upon me o king for i declare myself your suppliant then the god stayed his stream and stilled the waves making all calm before him and bringing him safely into the mouth of the river here at last ulysses knees and strong hands failed him for the sea had completely broken him his body was all swollen and his mouth and nostrils ran down like a river of sea-water so that he could neither breathe nor speak and lay swooning with sheer exhaustion presently when he got his breath and came to himself again he took off the scarf that eno had given him and threw it back into the salt stream of the river where Eno received it into her hands from the wave that bore it towards her then he left the river laid himself down among the rushes and kissed the bounteous earth alas he cried to himself in his dismay whatever will become of me and how is it all to end if i stay here upon the river bed through the long watches of the night i am so exhausted that the bitter cold and damp may make an end of me for toward sunrise there will be a keen wind blowing from off the river if on the other hand i climb the hillside find shelter in the woods and sleep in some thicket i may escape the cold and have a good night's rest but some savage beast may take advantage of me and devour me in the end he deemed it best to take to the woods and he found one upon some high ground not far from the water there he crept beneath two shoots of olive that grew from a single stalk the one an ungrafted sucker while the other had been grafted no wind however squally could break through the cover they afforded nor could the sun's rays pierce them nor the rain get through them so closely did they grow into one another ulysses crept under these and began to make himself a bed to lie on for there was a great litter of dead leaves lying about enough to make a covering for two or three men even in hard winter weather he was glad enough to see this so he laid himself down and heaped the leaves all round him then as one who lives alone in the country far from any neighbor hides a brand as fire seed in the ashes to save himself from having to get a light elsewhere even so did ulysses cover himself up with leaves and minerva shed a sweet sleep upon his eyes closed his eyelids and made him lose all memories of his sorrows End of Book Five. The Odyssey by Homer. Book Six. The Meeting Between Nausicaa and Ulysses. So here Ulysses slept, overcome by sleep and toil, but Minerva went off to the country and city of the Phaeacians, a people who used to live in the fair town of Hyperia, near the lawless Cyclopes. Now the Cyclopes were stronger than they, and plundered them, so their king, now Scythus, moved them thence, and settled them in Scaria, far from all other people. He surrounded the city with a wall, built houses and temples, and divided the lands among his people. But he was dead and gone to the house of Hades, and King Alcinous, whose counsels were inspired of heaven, was now reigning. To his house, then, did Minerva high in furtherance of the return of Ulysses. She went straight to the beautifully decorated bedroom in which there slept a girl who was as lovely as a goddess, Nausicaa, daughter to King Alcinous. Two maid-servants were sleeping near her, both very pretty, one on either side of the doorway, which was closed with well-made folding doors. Minerva took the form of the famous sea captain Dimas's daughter, who was a bosom friend of Nausicaa and just her own age. Then, coming up to the girl's bedside like a breath of wind, she hovered over her head and said, Nausicaa, what can your mother have been about to have such a lazy daughter? Here are your clothes all lying in disorder, yet you are going to be married almost immediately, and should not only be well dressed yourself, but should find good clothes for those who attend you. This is the way to get yourself a good name, and to make your father and mother proud of you. Suppose, then, that we make tomorrow a washing day, 
and start at daybreak. I will come and help you, so that you may have everything ready as soon as possible, for all the best young men among your own people are courting you, and you are not going to remain a maid much longer. Ask your father, therefore, to have a wagon and meals ready for us at daybreak, to have the rugs, robes, and girdles, and you can ride, too, which will be much pleasanter for you than walking, for the washing cisterns are some way from the town. When she had said this, Minerva went away to Olympus, which they say is the everlasting home of the gods. Here no wind beats roughly, and neither rain nor snow can fall, but it abides in everlasting sunshine, and in a great peacefulness of light, wherein the blessed gods are illumined for ever and ever. This was the place to which the goddess went when she had given instruction to the girl. By and by morning came and woke Nausicaa, who began wandering about her dream. She therefore went to the other end of the house to tell her father and mother all about it, and found them in their own room. Her mother was sitting by the fireside, spinning her purple yarn with her maids around her, and she happened to catch her father just as he was going out to attend a meeting of the town council which the Phaeacian alderman had convened. She stopped him and said, Papa, dear, could you manage to let me have a good big wagon? I want to take all our dirty clothes to the river and wash them. You are the chief man here, so it is only right that you should have a clean shirt when you attend meetings of the council. Moreover, you have five sons at home, two of them married, while the other three are good-looking bachelors. You know they always like to have clean linen when they go to a dance, and I have been thinking about all this. She did not say a word about her own wedding, for she did not like to, but her father knew and said, You shall have the mules, my love, and whatever else you have a mind for. Be off with you, and the men shall get you a good strong wagon, with a body to it that will hold all your clothes. On this he gave his orders to the servants, who got the wagon out, harnessed the mules, and put them to, while the girl brought the clothes down from the linen room and placed them on the wagon. Her mother prepared her a basket of provisions with all sorts of good things, and a goatskin full of wine. The girl now got into the wagon, and her mother gave her also a golden cruise of oil, that she and her women might anoint themselves. Then she took the whip and reins and lashed the mules on, whereon they set off, and their hoofs clattered on the road. They pulled without flagging, and carried not only Nausicaa and her wash of clothes, but the maids also who were with her. When they reached the waterside, they went to the washing cisterns, through which they ran at all times enough pure water to wash any quantity of linen, no matter how dirty. Here they unharnessed the mules and turned them out to feed on the sweet, juicy herbage that grew by the waterside. They took the clothes out of the wagon, put them in the water, and vied with one another in treading them in the pits to get the dirt out. After they had washed them and got them quite clean, they laid them out by the seaside, where the waves had raised a high beach of shingle, and set about washing themselves, and anointing themselves with olive oil. Then they got their dinner by the side of the stream, and waited for the sun to finish drying the clothes. When they had done dinner, they threw off the veils that covered their heads, and began to play at ball, while Nausicaa sang for them. As the huntress Diana goes forth upon the mountains of Taygetus or Erymanthus to hunt wild boars or deer, and the wood nymphs, daughter of ages bearing Jove, take their sport along with her, then is Leto proud at seeing her daughter stand a full head taller than the others, and eclipse the loveliest amid a whole bevy of beauties. Even so did the girl outshine her handmaids. 
When it was time for them to start home, and they were folding the clothes and putting them into the wagon, Minerva began to consider how Ulysses should wake up and see the handsome girl who was to conduct him to the city of the Phaeacians. The girl, therefore, threw a ball at one of the maids, which missed her and fell into deep water. On this they all shouted, and the noise they made woke Ulysses, who sat up in his bed of leaves and began to wonder what it might all be. Alas, said he to himself, what kind of people have I come amongst? Are they cruel, savage, and uncivilized, or hospitable and humane? I seem to hear the voice of young women, and they sound like those of the nymphs that haunt mountain tops, or springs of rivers and meadows of green grass. At any rate, I am among a race of men and women. Let me try if I cannot manage to get a look at them. As he said this, he crept from under his bush, and broke off a bough covered with thick leaves to hide his nakedness. He looked like some lion of the wilderness that stalks about exulting in his strength and defying both wind and rain. His eyes glare as he prowls in quest of oxen, sheep, or deer, for he is famished and will dare break even into a well-fenced homestead, trying to get at the sheep. Even such did Ulysses seem to the young women, as he drew near to them all naked as he was, for he was in great want. On seeing one so unkempt and so begrimed with salt water, the others scampered off along the spits that jutted out into the sea, but the daughter of Alcinous stood firm, for Minerva put courage into her heart and took away all fear from her. She stood right in front of Ulysses, and he doubted whether he should go up to her, throw himself at her feet and embrace her knees as a suppliant, or stay where he was and entreat her to give him some clothes and show him the way to the town. In the end he deemed it best to entreat her from a distance in case the girl should take offence at his coming near enough to clasp her knees. So he addressed her in a honeyed and persuasive language. "'O oh, queen,' he said, I implore your aid, but tell me, are you a goddess, or are you a mortal woman? If you are a goddess, and dwell in heaven, I can only conjecture that you are Jove's daughter Diana, for your face and figure resemble none but hers. If, on the other hand, you are a mortal, and live on earth, thrice happy are your father and mother, thrice happy too are your brothers and sisters. How proud and delighted they must feel when they see so fair a scion as yourself going out to a dance. Most happy, however, of all will be he whose wedding gifts have been the richest, and who takes you to his own home. I never yet saw any one so beautiful, neither man nor woman, and am lost in admiration as I behold you. I can only compare you to a young palm tree which I saw when I was at Delos, growing near the altar of Apollo, for I was there too, with much people after me. When I was on that journey which has been the source of all my troubles, never yet did such a young plant shoot out of the ground as that was, and I admired and wondered at it exactly as I now admire and wonder at yourself. I dare not clasp your knees, but I am in great distress. Yesterday made the twentieth day that I had been tossing about upon the sea. The winds and waves have taken me all the way from the Aegean island, and now fate has flung me upon this coast, that I may endure still further suffering, for I do not think that I have yet come to the end of it, but rather that heaven has still much evil in store for me. And now, O queen, have pity upon me, for you are the first person I have met and I know no one else in this country. Show me the way to your town, and let me have anything that you may have brought hither to wrap your clothes in. May heaven grant you in all things your heart's desire, husband, house, and a happy, peaceful home, for there is nothing better in this world than that man and wife should be of one mind in a house. 
It discomfits their enemies, makes the hearts of their friends glad, and they themselves know more about it than any one. To this Nausicaa answered, Stranger, you appear to be a sensible, well-disposed person. There is no accounting for luck. Jove gives prosperity to rich and poor just as he chooses. So you must take what he has seen fit to send you, and make the best of it. Now, however, you have come to this our country. You shall not want for clothes, nor for anything else that a foreigner in distress may reasonably look for. I will show you the way to the town, and will tell you the name of our people. We are called Phaeacians, and I am daughter to Alcinous, in whom the whole power of the state is vested. Then she called her maids and said, Stay where you are, you girls. Can you not see a man without running away from him? Do you take him for a robber or a murderer? Neither he nor anyone else can come here to do us Phaeacians any harm, for we are dear to the gods, and live apart on a land's end that juts into the sounding sea, and have nothing to do with any other people. This is only some poor man who has lost his way, and we must be kind to him, for strangers and foreigners in distress are under Jove's protection, and will take what they can get and be thankful. So, girls, give the poor fellow something to eat and drink, and wash him in the stream at some place that is sheltered from the wind. On this the maids left off running away, and began calling one another back. They made Ulysses sit down in the shelter, as Nausicaa had told them, and brought him a shirt and cloak. They also brought him the little golden cruse of oil, and told him to go and wash in the stream. But Ulysses said, Young women, please to stand a little on one side, that I may wash the brine from my shoulders and anoint myself with oil, for it is long enough since my skin has had a drop of oil upon it. I cannot wash as long as you all keep standing here. I am ashamed to strip before a number of good-looking young women. Then they stood on one side, and went to tell the girl, while Ulysses washed himself in the stream, and scrubbed the brine from his back and from his broad shoulders. When he had thoroughly washed himself, and had got the brine out of his hair, he anointed himself with oil, and put on the clothes which the girl had given him. And Minerva made him look taller and stronger than before. She also made the hair grow thick on the top of his head, and flow down in curls, like hyacinth blossoms. She glorified him about the head and shoulders as a skilful workman who has studied art of all kinds under Vulcan, and Minerva enriches a piece of silver plate by gilding it, and his work is full of beauty. Then he went and sat down a little way off upon the beach, looking quite young and handsome, and the girl gazed on him with admiration. Then she said to her maids, Hush, my dears, for I want to say something. I believe the gods who live in heaven have sent this man to the Phaeacians. When I first saw him, I thought him plain, but now his appearance is like that of the gods who dwell in heaven. I should like my future husband to be just such another as he is, if he would only stay here and not want to go away. However, give him something to eat and drink. They did as they were told, and set food before Ulysses, who ate and drank ravenously, for it was long since he had had food of any kind. Meanwhile, Nausicaa besought her of another matter. She got the linen folded and placed in the wagon, she then yoked the mules, and as she took her seat, she called Ulysses. Stranger, said she, rise and let us be going back to the town. I will introduce you at the house of my excellent father, where I can tell you that you will meet all the best people among the Phaeacians. But be sure and do as I bid you, for you seem to be a sensible person. As long as we are going past the fields and farmlands, follow briskly behind the wagon, along with the maids, 
and I will lead the way myself. Presently, however, we shall come to the town, where you will find a high wall running all round it, and a good harbour on either side, with a narrow entrance into the city, and the ships will be drawn up by the roadside, for every one has a place where his own ship can lie. You will see the market-place, with the temple of Neptune in the middle of it, and paved with large stones bedded in the earth. Here people deal in ship's gear of all kinds, such as cables and sails, and here, too, are the places where oars are made, for the Phaeacians are not a nation of archers, they know nothing about bows and arrows, but are a seafaring folk, and pride themselves on their masts, oars and ships, with which they travel far over the sea. I am afraid of the gossip and scandal that may be set on foot against me later on, for the people here are very ill-natured, and some low fellow, if he met us, might say, Who is this fine-looking stranger that is going about with Nausicaa? Where did she find him? I suppose she is going to marry him. Perhaps he is a vagabond sailor, whom she has taken from some foreign vessel, for we have no neighbours, or some god has at last come down from heaven in answer to her prayers, and she is going to live with him all the rest of her life. It would be a good thing if she would take herself off and find a husband somewhere else, for she will not look at one of the many excellent young Phaeacians who are in love with her. This is the kind of disparaging remark that would be made about me, and I could not complain, for I should myself be scandalized at seeing any other girl do the like, and go about with men in spite of everybody, while her father and mother were still alive, and without having been married in the face of all the world. If, therefore, you want my father to give you an escort, and to help you home, do as I bid you. You will see a beautiful grove of poplars by the roadside, dedicated to Minerva. It has a well in it, and a meadow all around it. Here my father has a field of rich garden ground, about as far from the town as a man's voice will carry. Sit down there, and wait for a while, till the rest of us can get into the town, and reach my father's house. Then, when you think we must have done this, come into the town, and ask the way to the house of my father, Alcinus. You will have no difficulty in finding it, any child will point it out to you, for no one else in the whole town has anything like such a fine house as he has. When you have got past the gates, and through the outer court, go right across the inner court, till you come to my mother. You will find her sitting by the fire and spinning her purple wool by firelight. It is a fine sight to see her, as she leans back against one of the bearing posts, with her maids all ranged behind her. Close to her seat stands that of my father, on which he sits and topes like an immortal god. Never mind him, but go up to my mother and lay your hands upon her knees, if you would get home quickly. If you can gain her over, you may hope to see your own country again, no matter how distant it may be. So saying, she lashed the mules with her whip, and they left the river. The mules drew well, and their hoofs went up and down upon the road. She was careful not to go too fast for Ulysses and the maids who were following on foot along with the wagon, so she plied her whip with judgment. As the sun was going down, they came to the sacred grove of Minerva, and there Ulysses sat down and prayed to the mighty daughter of Jove. Hear me, he cried, daughter of ages bearing Jove, unweariable, Hear me now, for you gave no heed to my prayers when Neptune was wrecking me. Now therefore have pity upon me, and grant that I may find friends, and be hospitably received by the Phaeacians. Thus did he pray, and Minerva heard his prayer, but she would not show herself to him openly, 
for she was afraid of her uncle Neptune, who was still furious in his endeavours to prevent Ulysses from getting home. End of Book Six The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book Seven Reception of Ulysses at the Palace of King Alcinous Thus then did Ulysses wait and pray, but the girl drove on to the town. When she reached her father's house she drew up at the gateway, and her brothers, comely as the gods, gathered round her, took the mules out of the wagon, and carried the clothes into the house while she went to her own room, where an old servant, Eurymedusa of Aperia, lit the fire for her. This old woman had been brought by sea from Aperia, and had been chosen as a prize for Alcinous, because he was king over the Phaeacians, and the people obeyed him as though he were a god. She had been nursed to Nausicaa, and had now lit the fire for her, and brought her supper for her in her own room. Presently Ulysses got up to go towards town, and Minerva shed a thick mist all round him to hide him in case of the proud Phaeacians who met him should be rude to him or ask him who he was. Then, as he was just entering the town, she came towards him in the likeness of a little girl carrying a pitcher. She stood right in front of him, and Ulysses said, My dear, will you be so kind as to show me the house of King Alcinous? I am an unfortunate foreigner in distress, and do not know one in your town and country. Then Minerva said, Yes, father stranger, I will show you the house you want, for Alcinous lives quite close to my own father. I will go before you and show you the way, but say not a word as you go, and do not look at any man, nor ask him questions, for the people here cannot abide strangers, and do not like men who come from some other place. They are a seafaring folk, and sail the seas by the grace of Neptune in ships that glide along, like thought, or as a bird in the air. On this she led the way, and Ulysses followed in her steps but not one of the Phaeacians could see him as he passed through the city in the midst of them, for the great goddess Minerva, in her good will towards him, had hidden him in a thick cloud of darkness. He admired their harbors, ships, places of assembly, and lofty walls of the city, which, with the palisade on top of them, were very striking, and when they reached the king's house, Minerva said, This is the house, father stranger, which you would have me show you. You will find a number of great people sitting at table, but do not be afraid. Go straight in, for the bolder a man is, the more likely he is to carry his point, even though he is a stranger. First find the queen, her name is Arete, and she comes of the same family as her husband, Alcinous. They both descend originally from Neptune, who was father to Nausithus, by Periboea, a woman of great beauty. Periboea was the youngest daughter of Eurymedon, who at one time reigned over all the giants, but he ruined his ill-fated people and lost his own life to boot. Neptune, however, lay with his daughter, and she had a son by him, the, the great Nausithus, who reigned over the Phaeacians. Nausithus had two sons, Rexenor and Alcinous. Apollo killed the first of them while he was still a bridegroom and without male issue but he left a daughter Arete, whom Alcinous married, and honors as no other woman is honored of all those that keep house along with their husbands. Thus she both was, and still is, respected beyond measure by her children, by Alcinous himself, and by the whole people who look upon her as a goddess, and greet her wherever she goes about the city, for she is a thoroughly good woman both in head and heart. And when any women are friends of hers, she will help their husbands so to settle their disputes. If you can gain her goodwill, you may have every hope of seeing your friends again and getting safely back to your home and country. Then Minerva left Sheria and went away over the sea. She went to Marathon and to the spacious streets of Athens, where she entered the abode of Erechtheus. But Ulysses went on to the house of Alcinous, and he pondered much as he paused a while before reaching the threshold of bronze, for the splendor of the palace was like that of the sun or moon. The walls on either side were of bronze from end to end, and the cornice was of blue enamel. The doors were gold and hung on pillars of silver that rose from the floor of bronze, while the lintel was silver and the hook of the door was gold. 
On either side there stood gold and silver mastiffs which Vulcan, with his consummate skill, had fashioned expressly to keep watch over the palace of King Alcinous. So they were immortal and could never grow old. Seats were ranged all along the wall, here and there from one end to the other, with coverings of fine woven work which the woman of the house had made. Here the chief persons of the Phaeacians used to sit and eat and drink, for there was abundance at all seasons, and there were golden figures of young men with lighted torches in their hands raised on pedestals to give light by night to those who were at table. There are fifty maid servants in the house, some of whom are always grinding rich yellow grain at the mill, while others work at the loom or sit and spin, and their shuttles go backwards and forwards like the fluttering of aspen leaves, while the linen is so closely woven that it will turn oil. As the Phaeacians are the best sailors in the world, so their women excel all others in weaving, for Minerva has taught them all manner of useful arts, and they are very intelligent. Outside the gate of the outer court there is a large garden of about four acres with a wall all round it. It is full of beautiful trees, pears, pomegranates, and the most delicious apples. There are luscious figs also, and olives in full growth. The fruits never rot nor fail all year round, neither winter nor summer, for the air is so soft that a new crop ripens before the old has dropped. Pear grows on pear, apple on apple, and fig on fig, and so also with the grapes, for there is an excellent vineyard. On the level ground of a part of this, the grapes are being made into raisins, in another part they are being gathered. Some are being trodden in the wine tubs, others further on have shed their blossom and are beginning to show fruit, others again are just changing color. In the furthest part of the ground there are beautifully arranged beds of flowers that are in bloom all year round. Two streams go through it, the one turned in ducks throughout the whole garden, while the other is carried under a ground of the outer court of the house itself, and the town's people draw water from it. Such, then, were the splendors with which the gods had endowed the house of King Alcinous. So here Ulysses stood for a while and looked about him. But when he looked long enough, he crossed the threshold and went within the precincts of the house. There he found all the chief people among the Phaeacians making their drink offerings to Mercury, which they always did last thing before going away for the night. He went straight through the court, still hidden by the cloak of darkness in which Minerva had enveloped him, till he reached Arete and King Alcinous. Then he laid his hands upon the knees of the queen, and at the moment the miraculous darkness fell away from him, and he became visible. Everyone was speechless with surprise at seeing a man there, but Ulysses began at once with his petition. Queen Arete, he exclaimed, daughter of great Rexenor, in my distress I humbly pray you, as also your husband and these your guests, whom may heaven prosper with long life and happiness, and may they leave their possessions to their children, and all the honors conferred upon them by the state, to help me home to my own country as soon as possible, for I have been long in trouble and away from my friends. Then he sat down on the hearth among the ashes, and they all held their peace till presently the old hero Echinus who was an excellent speaker and an elder among the Phaeacians, plainly and in all honesty addressed them thus. Alcinous, he said, it is not creditable to you that a stranger should be seen sitting among the ashes of your hearth. Everyone is waiting to hear what you are about to say. Tell him, then, to rise and take a seat on a stool inlaid with silver, and bid your servants mix some wine and water that we may drink an offering to Jove, the Lord of Thunder who takes all well-disposed suppliants under his protection, and let the housekeeper give him some supper of whatever there may be in the house. When Alcinous heard this, he took Ulysses by the hand, raised him from the hearth, and bade him take the seat of Laodamus, who had been sitting beside him, and was his favorite son. A maid-servant then brought him water in a beautiful golden ewer, and poured it in a silver base basin for him to wash his hands, and she drew a clean table beside him. An upper servant brought him bread, and offered him many good things of what there was in the house, and Ulysses ate and drank. Then Alcinous said to one of the servants, Pontinus, mix a cup of wine, and hand it round, that we may drink offerings to Jove, the lord of thunder, who is the protector of all well-disposed suppliants. 
Pontinus then mixed wine and water, and handed it round after giving every man his drink offering. Then they made their offerings, and drunk each as much as he was minded, Alcinous said. Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, hear my words. You have had your supper, so now go home to bed. Tomorrow morning I shall invite a still larger number of aldermen, and will give a sacrificial banquet in honour of our guest. We can then discuss the question of his escort, and consider how we may at once send him back rejoicing to his own country without trouble or inconvenience to himself, no matter how distant it may be. We must see that he comes to no harm while on his homeward journey, but when he is once at home he will have to take the luck he was born with, for better or for worse, like other people. It is possible, however, that the stranger is one of the immortals who has come down from heaven to visit us, but in this case the gods are departing from their usual practice, for hitherto they have made themselves perfectly clear to us when we have been offering them hecatombs. They come and sit at our feast just like one of ourselves, and if any solitary wayfarer happens to stumble upon some or other of them, they effect no concealment, for we are as near of kin to the gods as the cyclopses and the savage giants are. Then Ulysses said, Pray, Alcinous, do not take any such notion into your head. I have nothing of the immortal about me, neither in my body nor mind, and most resemble those among you who are the most afflicted. Indeed, were I to tell you all that heaven has seen fit to lay upon me, you would say that I was still worse off than they are. Nevertheless, let me sup in spite of sorrow, for an empty stomach is very inopportune thing, and thrusts itself on a man's notice no matter how dire is his distress. I am in great trouble, yet it insists that I shall eat and drink, bids me lay aside all memory of my sorrows, and dwell only on the due replenishing of itself. As for yourselves, do as you propose, and at break of day set about helping me to get home. I shall be content to die if I may first once more behold my property, my bondsmen, and all the greatness of my house. Thus did he speak, Everyone approved his saying and agreed that he should have his escort, inasmuch as he had spoken reasonably. Then, when they made their drink offerings, and had drunk each as much as he was minded, they went home to bed every man in his own abode, leaving Ulysses in the cloister with Arete and Alcinous, while the servants were taking the things away after supper. Arete was the first to speak, for she recognized the shirt, cloak, and good clothes that Ulysses was wearing, as the work of herself and of her maids. So she said, Stranger, before we go any further, there is a question I should like to ask you. Who and whence are you, and who gave you those clothes? Did you not say you had come from beyond the sea? And Ulysses answered, It would be a long story, madam, were I to relate in full the tale of my misfortunes, for the hand of heaven has been laid heavy upon me. But as regards your question— there is an island far away in the sea which is called the Ogygian. Here dwells the cunning and powerful goddess Calypso, daughter of Atlas. She lives by herself, far from all neighbors, human or divine. Fortune, however, brought me to her hearth, all desolate and alone, for Jove struck my ship with his thunderbolts and broke it up in mid-ocean. My brave comrades were drowned, every man of them, but I stuck to the keel, and was carried hither and thither for the space of nine days, till at last, during the darkness of the tenth night, the gods brought me to the Ogygian island, where the great goddess Calypso lives. She took me in and treated me with the utmost kindness. Indeed, she wanted to make me immortal, that I might never grow old, but she could not persuade me to let her do so. I stayed with Calypso seven years straight on end, and watered the good clothes she gave me with my tears during the whole time, but at last, when the eighth year came round, she bade me depart of her own free will, either because Jove had told her she must, or because she had changed her mind. She sent me from her island on a raft, which she provisioned with abundance of bread and wine. Moreover, she gave me good stout clothing, and sent me a wind that blew warm and fair." Days seven and ten did I sail over the sea, and on the eighteenth I caught sight of the first outlines of the mountains upon your coast, and glad indeed was I to set eyes upon them. 
Nevertheless, there was still much trouble in store for me, for at this point Neptune would let me go no further, and raised a great storm against me. The sea was so terribly high that I could no longer keep my raft, which went to pieces under the fury of the gale, and I had to swim for it till wind and current brought me to your shores. There I tried to land, but could not, for it was a bad place, and the waves dashed me against the rocks. So I again took to the sea and swam on till I came to a river that seemed the most likely landing place, for there were no rocks and it was sheltered from the wind. Here, then, I got out of the water and gathered my senses together again. Night was coming on, so I left the river and went into a thicket where I covered myself all over with leaves, and presently heaven sent me off into a very deep sleep. Sick and sorry I was, I slept among the leaves all night, and through the next day till afternoon, when I woke as the sun was westering and saw your daughter's maid-servants playing upon the beach, and your daughter among them looking like a goddess. I besought her aid, and she proved to be of excellent disposition, much more so than could be expected from so young a person, for young people are apt to be thoughtless. She gave me plenty of bread and wine, and when she had me washed in the river she also gave me the clothes in which you see me. Now, therefore, though it has pained me to do so, I have told you the whole truth." Then Alcinous said, Stranger, it was very wrong of my daughter not to bring you on at once to my house along with the maids, seeing that she was the first person whose aid you asked. Pray do not scold her, replied Ulysses. She is not to blame. She did tell me to follow along with the maids, but I was ashamed and afraid, for I thought you might perhaps be displeased if you saw me. Every human being is sometimes a little suspicious and irritable. Stranger, replied Alcinous, I am not the kind of man to get angry about nothing. It is always better to be reasonable, but by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, now that I see what kind of person you are and how much you think as I do, I wish you would stay here, marry my daughter, and become my son-in-law. If you will stay, I will give you a house and an estate, but no one, heaven forbid, shall keep you here against your own wish. And that you may be sure of this, I will attend to-morrow to the matter of your escort." You can sleep during the whole voyage if you like, and the men shall sail you over smooth waters either to your own home or wherever you please, even though it may be a long way further off than Euboea, which those of my people who saw it when they took yellow-haired Radamanthus to see Titius, the son of Gaia, tell me is the furthest of any place. And yet they did the whole voyage in a single day without distressing themselves and came back again afterwards. You will thus see how much my ships excel all others, and what magnificent oarsmen my sailors are. Then Ulysses was glad, and prayed aloud, saying, Father Jove, grant that Alcinous may do all that he has said, for he so will win an imperishable name among mankind, and at the same time I shall return to my country. Thus did they converse. Then Arete told her maids to set a bed in the room, that was in the gatehouse, and make it with good red rugs, and to spread coverlets on the top of them with woolen cloaks for Ulysses to wear. The maids thereon went out with torches in their hands, and when they had made their bed they came up to Ul Ulysses and said, Rise, sir stranger, and come with us, for your bed is ready. And glad indeed was he to go to his rest. So Ulysses slept in a bed placed in a room over the echoing gateway, but Alcinous lay in the inner part of the house with the queen, his wife, by his side. End of Ulysses, Book 7 The Odyssey by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book 8 Banquet in the House of Alcinous The Games Now when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, Alcinous and Ulysses both rose, Alcinous led the way to the Phaeacian place of assembly, which was near the ships. When they got there, they sat down side by side on a seat of polished stone, while Minerva took the form of one of Alcinous's servants, and went round the town in order to help Ulysses to get home. She went up to the citizens, man by man, and said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, come to the assembly, all of you, and listen to the stranger, who has just come off a long voyage to the house of King Alcinous. He looks like an immortal god. With these words, she made them all want to come, and they flocked to the assembly till seats and standing room were alike crowded. Every one was struck with the appearance of Ulysses, 
for Minerva had beautified him about the head and shoulders, making him look taller and stouter than he really was, that he might impress the Phaeacians favorably as being a very remarkable man, and might come off well in the many trials of skill to which they would challenge him. Then, when they were all to got together, Alcinous spoke. Hear me, said he, aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, that I may speak even as I am minded. This stranger, whoever he may be, has found his way to my house from somewhere or other, east or west. He wants an escort, and wishes to have the matter settled. Let us then get one ready for him, as we have done for others before him. Indeed, no one has ever yet come to my house who has been able to complain of me not speeding him on his way soon enough. Let us draw a ship into the sea, one that has never yet made a voyage, and man her with two and fifty of our smartest young sailors. Then, when you have made fast the oars, each by his own seat, leave the ship and come to my house to prepare a feast. I will find you and everything. I am giving these instructions to the young men who will form the crew. For as regards you aldermen and town councillors, you will join me in entertaining our guests in the cloisters. I can take no excuses, and we will have Demodocus to sing for us, for there was no bard like him, whatever he may choose to sing about. Alcinous then led the way, and the others followed after while a servant went to fetch Demodocus. The fifty-two picked oarsmen went to the seashore as they had been told, and when they got there, they drew the ship into the water, got her mast and sails inside her, bound the oars to the thole pins with twisted thongs of leather, all in due course, and spread the white sails aloft. They moored the vessel a little way out from land, and then came on shore and went to the house of King Alcinous. The outhouses, yards, and all the precincts were filled with crowds of men in great multitudes, both old and young, and Alcinous killed them a dozen sheep, eight full-grown pigs, and two oxen. These were skinned and dressed so as to provide a magnificent banquet. A servant presently led in the famous bard Demodocus, whom the muse had dearly loved, but to whom she had given both good and evil, for though she had endowed him with a divine gift of song, she had robbed him of his eyesight. Pontinus set a seat for him among the guests, leading it up against a bearing post. He hung the lyre for him on a peg over his head, and showed him where he was to fill for it with his hands. He also set a fair table with a basket of victuals by his side, and a cup of wine from which he might drink whenever he was so disposed. The company then laid their hands upon the good things that were before them, but as soon as they had enough to eat and drink, the muse inspired Demodocus to sing the feats of heroes, and more especially, a matter that was in the mouths of all men, to wit, the quarrel between Achilles and Ulysses, and the fierce words that they heaped on one another, as they sat together at a banquet. But Agamemnon was glad when he heard his chieftains quarreling with one another, for Apollo had foretold this at Pitho, when he crossed the stone floor to consult the oracle. Here was the beginning of the evil that was by the will of Jove, fell upon the Danaeans and Trojans. Thus sang the bard, but Ulysses drew his purple mantle over his head and covered his face, for he was ashamed to let the Phaeacians see that he was weeping. When the bard left off singing, he wiped his tears from his eyes, uncovered his face, and taking his cup, made a drink offering to the gods. But when the Phaeacians pressed Demodocus to sing further, for they delighted in his lays, then Ulysses again drew them his mantle over his head and wept bitterly. No one noticed his distress except Alcinous, who was sitting near him, and heard the heavy sighs that he was heaving. So he at once said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phaeacians, we have had enough now, both of the feast and of the minstrelry, that is its due accompaniment. Let us proceed, therefore, to the athletic sports, so that our guest on his return home may be able to tell his friends how much we surpass all other nations as boxers, wrestlers, jumpers, and runners. With these words he led the way, and the others followed after. A servant hung Demodocus's lyre on its peg for him, and led him out of the cloister, and set him on the same way as that along which all the chief men of the Phaeacians were going to see the sports. A crowd of several thousands of people followed them, and there were many excellent competitors, for all the prizes. Acronios, Achalius, Elatrius, Nateus, Primnius, Anchialus, Eretmius, Pontius, Proreus, Thune, Anabesius, and Amphilius, son of Polinius, son of Tecton. 
There were also Aurelius, son of Noblus, who was like Mars himself, and was the best-looking man among the Phaeacians, except Laudamus. Three sons of Alcinus, Laudamus, Halios, and Clytonius, competed also. The foot races came first. The course was set out for them from the starting post, and they raised a dust upon the plain as they all flew forward at the same moment. Clytonius came in first, a long way. He left everyone else behind him by the length of the furrow that a couple of mules can plow in a fallow field. They then turned to the painful art of wrestling, and here Euryalus proved to be the best man. Amphilius excelled all the others in jumping, while at throwing the disc there was no one who could approach Elatrius. Alcinous's son, Laudamus, was the best boxer, and he it was who presently said, when they had all been diverted with the games, Let us ask the stranger whether he excels in any of these sports. He seems very powerfully built. His thighs, calves, hands, and neck are all of prodigious strength. Nor is he at all old, but he has suffered much lately, and there is nothing like the sea for making havoc with a man, no matter how strong he is. You're quite right, Laudamus, replied Euralius. Go up to your guest and speak to him about it yourself. When Laudamus heard this, he made his way into the middle of the crowd and said to Ulysses, I hope, sir, that you will enter yourself for some one or other of our competitions, if you are skilled in any of them, and you must have gone in for many a one before now. There is nothing that does anyone so much credit all his life long as the showing himself a proper man with his hands and feet. Have a try, therefore, at something, and banish all sorrow from your mind. Your return home will not be long delayed, for the ship is already drawn into the water, and the crew is found. Ulysses answered, Laudamus, why do you taunt me in this way? My mind is set rather on cares than contests. I have been through infinite trouble, and come among you now as a supplement, praying your king and people to further me on my return home. Then Eurelius, reviling him outright, said, I gather then that you are unskilled in any of the many sports that men generally delight in. I suppose that you are one of those grasping traders that go about in ships, as captains or merchants, and who think of nothing but their outward freights and homeward cargoes. That does not seem to be much of the athlete about you. For shame, sir, answered Ulysses fiercely. You are an insolent fellow. So true is it that the gods do not grace all men alike in speech, person, and understanding. One man may be weak of presence, but heaven has adorned this with such a good conversation that he charms everyone who sees him. His honeyed moderation carries his hearers with him, so that he is a leader in all assemblies of his fellows. Wherever he goes, he is looked upon to. Another may be as handsome as a god, but his good looks are not crowned with discretion. This is your case. No god could make a finer looking fellow than you are, but you are a fool. Your ill-judged remarks have made me exceedingly angry, and you are quite mistaken, for I excel in a great many athletic exercises. Indeed, so long as I had youth and strength, I was among the first athletes of the age. Now, however, I am worn out by labor and sorrow, for I have gone through much, both on the field of battle and by the waves of the sea. Still, in spite of all this, I will compete, for your taunts have stung me to the quick. So he hurried up, without even taking his cloak off, and seized the disc, larger, more massive, and much heavier than those used by the Phaeacians when disthrowing among themselves. Then, swinging it back, he threw it from his brawny hand, and made a humming sound in the air as he did so. The Phaeacians quailed beneath the rushing of its flight as it sped gracefully from his hand, and flew beyond any mark that had been made yet. Minerva, in the form of a man, came and marked the place where it had been fallen. A blind man, sir, said she, could easily tell your mark by groping for it. It is so far ahead of any other. You may make your mind easy about this contest, for no Phaeacian can come near to such a throw as yours. Ulysses was glad when he had found a friend among the onlookers, for he had begun to speak more pleasantly. Young men, said he, come up to that throw if you can, and I will throw another disc as heavy, or even heavier. If any one wants to have a bout with me, let him come on, for I am exceedingly angry. I will box, wrestle, or run. I do not care what it is, for any man among you, all except Laudamus, but not with him, because I am his guest, and one cannot compete with one's own personal friend. At least I do not think it a prudent or sensible thing for a guest to challenge his host's family at any game, especially when he is in a foreign country. 
he will cut the ground from under his own feet if he does. But I will make no exception as regards any one else, for I want to have the matter out and know which is the best man. I am a good hand at every kind of athletic sport known among mankind. I am an excellent archer. In battle I am always the first to bring a man down with my arrow, no matter how many more are taking aim at him alongside of me. Philoctetes was the only man who could shoot better than me when we Achaeans were before Troy and in practice. I far excel everyone else in the whole world of those who still eat bread upon the face of the earth, but I should not like to shoot against the mighty deed, such as Hercules, or Erectus, the Ocalian, men who could shoot against the gods themselves. This, in fact, is how Eurytus came prematurely by his end, for Apollo was angry with him and killed him because he challenged him as an archer. I can throw a dart faster than anyone else can shoot an arrow. Running is the only point in respect of which I am afraid some of the Phoenicians might beat me, for I have been brought down very low at sea, my provisions run short, and therefore I am still weak. They all held their peace, except King Alcinous, who began, Sir, we have had much pleasure in hearing all that you have told us, from which I understand that you are willing to show your prowess as having been displeased with some of our insolent remarks that have been made to you by one of our athletes, and which could never have been uttered by any one who knows how to talk with propriety. I hope you will apprehend my meaning, and will explain to any one of your chief men who may be dining with yourself and your family when you get home that we have an hereditary aptitude for accomplishments of all kinds. We are not particularly remarkable for our boxing, nor yet as wrestlers, but we are singularly fleet of foot and are excellent sailors. We are extremely fond of good dinners, music, and dancing. We also like frequent changes of linen, warm baths, and good beds. So now, please, some of you who are the best dancers set about dancing, that our guest on his return home may be able to tell his friends how much we surpass all other nations as sailors, runners, dancers, and minstrels. Demodocus has left his lyre at my house, so run some one or other of you and fetch it for him. On this, a servant hurried off to bring the lyre from the king's house, and the nine men who had been chosen as stewards stood forward. It was their business to manage everything connected with the sports, so they made the ground smooth and marked a wide space for the dancers. Presently, the servant came back with Demodocus's lyre, and he took his place in the midst of them, whereupon the best young dancers in the town began to foot and trip it so nimbly that Ulysses was delighted with the merry twinkling of their feet. Meanwhile, the bard had begun to sing the loves of Venus and Mars, and how they first began their intrigue in the house of Vulcan. Mars made Venus many presents, and defiled King Vulcan's marriage bed, so the son, who saw what they were about, told Vulcan. Vulcan was very angry when he heard such dreadful news, so he went to his smithy, brooding mischief, got his great anvil into its place, and began to forge some change which none could unloose or break, so that they might stay in that place. When he had finished his snare, he went off to his bedroom, and festooned the bedposts all over with chains like cobwebs. He also let many hang down from the great beam of the ceiling. Not even a god could see them, so fine and subtle were they. As soon as he had spread the chains all over the bed, he made as though he were setting off for the fair state of Lemnos, which of all places in the world was the one he was the most fond of. But Mars kept no blind lookout, and as soon as he saw him start, hurried off to his house, burning with love for Venus. Now Venus had just come in from a visit to her father Jove, and was sitting down when Mars came inside the house and said, as he took her hand into his own, let us go to the couch of Vulcan. He is not at home, but has gone off to Lemnos, among the Sintians, whose speech is barbarous. She was nothing loath, so they went to the couch to take their rest, whereupon they were caught in the toils which cunning Vulcan had spread for them, and could neither get up nor stir hand or foot, but found too late that they were in a trap. Then Vulcan came up to them, for he had turned back before reaching Lemnos, when his scout the sun told him what was going on. He was in a furious passion, and stood in the vestibule, making a dreadful noise as he shouted to all the gods. Father Jove, he cried, and all you other blessed gods who live forever, come here and see the ridiculous and disgraceful sight which I will show you. Jove's daughter, Venus, is always dishonoring me because I am lame. She is in love with Mars, who is handsome and clean-built, whereas I am a cripple. But my parents are to blame for that, 
not I. They ought never to have begotten me. Come and see the pair together asleep on my bed. It makes me furious to look at them. They are very fond of one another, but I do not think that they will lie there longer than they can help, nor do I think that they will sleep much. There, however, they will stay till her father has repaid me the sum I gave him for his baggage of a daughter, who is fair, but not honest. On this the gods gathered to the house of Vulcan. Earth encircling Neptune came, and Mercury the bringer of luck, and King Apollo. But the goddesses stayed at home, all of them for shame. Then the giver of all good things stood in the doorway, and the blessed gods roared with inextinguishable laughter as they saw how cunning Vulcan had been, whereon one would turn towards his neighbor, saying, Ill deeds do not prosper, and the weak is confound the strong. See how limping Vulcan, lame as he is, has caught Mars, who is the fleetest god in heaven, and now Mars will be caught and cast in heavy damages. Thus did they converse, but King Apollo said to Mercury, Messenger Mercury, giver of good things, you would not care how strong the chains were, would you, if you could sleep with Venus? King Apollo answered Mercury, I only wish I might get the chance, though they were three times as many chains, and you might look on, all of you, gods and goddesses, but I would sleep with her if I could. The immortal gods burst out laughing as they heard him, but Neptune took it all seriously and kept imploring Vulcan to set Mars free again. Let him go, he cried, and I will undertake as you require that he shall pay you all the damages that you are held responsible among the immortal gods. Do not, replied Vulcan, ask me to do this. A bad man's bond is bad security. What remedy could I enforce against you if Mars should go away and leave his debts behind him, along with his chains? Vulcan, said Neptune, if Mars goes away without repaying his damages, I will pay you myself. So Vulcan answered, in this case, I cannot and must not refuse you. Thereon he loosed the bonds that bound them, and as soon as they were free they scampered off, Mars to Thrace, and the laughter-loving Venus to Cyprus, and to Paphos, where is her grove and her altar fragrant with burnt offerings. Here the graces bathed her, and anointed her with oil of ambrosia, such as the immortal gods make use of, and they clothed her in raiment of the most enchanting beauty. Thus sang the bard, and both Ulysses and the seafaring Phaeacians were charmed as they heard him. Then Alcinous told Laodamus and Helias to dance alone, for there was no one to compete with them. So they took a red ball, which Polybius had made for them, and one of them bent himself backwards and threw it up towards the clouds, while the other jumped from off the ground and caught it with ease before it came down again. When they had done throwing the ball straight up into the air, they began to dance, and at the same time kept on throwing it backwards and forwards to one another, while all the young men in the ring applauded and made a great stamping of their feet. Then Ulysses said, King Alcinous, you said your people were the nimblest dancers in the world, and so indeed they have proved themselves to be so. I am astonished, even as I saw them. The king was delighted at all this, and exclaimed to the Phoeacians, Aldermen and town councillors, our guest seems to be a person of singular judgment. Let us give him proof of our hospitality, as he may reasonably expect. There are twelve chief men among you, and counting myself, there are thirteen. Contribute, each of you, a clean cloak, a shirt, and a talent of fine gold. Let us give him all this in a lump down at once, so that when he gets his supper he may do so with a light heart. As for Euralius, he will have to make a far more apology, and a present too, for he has been rude. Thus did he speak. The others, all of them, applauded him, and sent their servants to fetch the presents. Then Euralius said, King Alcinous, I will give the stranger all the satisfaction you require. He shall have my sword, which is of bronze, all but the hilt, which is of silver. I will also give him the scabbard, which is newly sawn ivory into which it fits. It will be worth a great deal to him. As he spoke, he placed the sword in the hand of Ulysses and said, Good luck to you, father stranger. If anything has been said amiss, may the winds blow it away with that, and may heaven grant you a safe return, for I understand you have been a long way away from home, and have gone through much hardship. To which Ulysses answered, Good luck to you too, my friends, and may the gods grant you every happiness. I hope you will not miss the sword you have given me along with your apology. 
With these words, he girded the sword about his shoulders, and towards sundown, the presents began to make their appearance, as the servants of the donors kept bringing them to the house of King Alcinous. Here his sons received them and placed them under their mother's charge. Then Alcinous led the way to the house and bade his guests take their seats. Wife, said he, turning to Queen Arete, go, fetch the best chest we have, and put a clean cloak and shirt in it. Also set a copper on the fire and heat some water. Our guests will take a warm bath. See also to the careful packing of the presents that the noble Phaeacians had made him. He will thus better enjoy both his supper and the singing that will follow. I shall myself give him this golden goblet, which is of exquisite workmanship, that he may be reminded of me for the rest of his life, whenever he makes a drink offering to Jove or to any of the gods. Then Arete told her maids to set a large tripod upon the fire as fast as they could, whereon they set a tripod full of bath water onto a clear fire. They threw on sticks to make it blaze, and when the water became hot, as the flame played upon the belly of the tripod. Meanwhile, Arete brought a magnificent chest from her own room, and inside it she packed all the beautiful presents of gold and the raiment which the Phoeacians had brought. Lastly, she added a cloak and a good shirt from Alcinous, and said to Ulysses, See to the lid yourself, and have the whole bound round at once, for fear any one should rob you, by the way when you are asleep in your ship. When Ulysses heard this, he put the lid on the chest, and made it fast with the bond that Circe had taught him. He had done so before an upper servant told him to come to the bath and wash himself. He was very glad of a warm bath, for he had no one to wait upon him ever since he had left the house of Calypso, who was, as long as he remained with her, had taken as good of care of him as though he had been a god. When the servants had done washing and anointing him with oil, and had given him a clean cloak and shirt, he left the bathroom and joined the guests who were sitting over their wine. Lovely Nausicaa stood by one of the bearing posts supporting the roof of the cloister, and admired him as she saw him pass. Farewell, stranger, said she. Do not forget me when you are safe at home again, for it is to me first that you owe a ransom for having saved your life. And Ulysses said, Nausicaa, daughter of the great Alcinous, may Jove, the mighty husband of Juno, grant that I may reach my home, so I shall bless you as my guardian angel all my days, for it was you who saved me. When he had said this, he seated himself beside Alcinous. Supper was then served, and the wine was mixed for drinking. A servant led the favorite bard Demodocus, and set him in the midst of the company, near one of the bearing posts, supporting the cloister that he may lean against it. Then Ulysses cut off a piece of roast pork with plenty of fat, for there was abundance left on the joint, and said to a servant, Take this piece of pork over to Demodocus, and tell him to eat it. For all the pain his lays may cause me, I will salute him none the less. Bards are honored and respected throughout the world, for the muse teaches them their songs and loves them. The servant carried the pork in his fingers over to Demodocus, who took it and was very much pleased. They then laid their hands on all the good things that were before them, and as soon as they had to eat and drink, Ulysses said to Demodocus, Demodocus, there was no one in the world whom I admire more than I do you. You must have studied under the muse, Jove's daughter, and under Apollo, so accurately do you sing of the return of the Achaeans, with all of their sufferings and adventures. If you were not there yourself, you must have heard it all from someone who was. Now, however, change your song, and tell us of the wooden horse, which Epius made with the assistance of Minerva, and which Ulysses got by stratagem into the fort of Troy, after freighting it with the men who afterwards sacked the city. If you will sing this tale aright, I will tell all the world how magnificently heaven has endowed you. The bard was inspired of heaven, took up the story at the point where some of the Argives set fire to their tents and sailed away, while others, hidden within the horse, were waiting with Ulysses in the Trojan place of assembly. For the Trojans themselves had drawn the horse into their fortress, and it stood there while they sat at council round it, and they were in three minds as to what they should do. Some were for breaking it up, then and there. Others would have it dragged to the top of the rock on which the fortress stood, and then thrown down the precipice, while yet others were for letting it remain as an offering, propitiation for the gods. And this was how they settled it in the end, for the city was doomed when it took in that horse, 
within which were all the bravest of the Argives, waiting to bring death and destruction to the Trojans. And on he sang how the sons of the Achaeans issued from the horse, and sacked the town, breaking out from their ampuscade. He sang how they overran the city, hither and thither, and ravaged it, and how Ulysses went raging like Mars along with Menelaus to the house of Deiphobus. It was there that the fight raged most furiously. Nevertheless, by Minerva's help, he was victorious. All this he told, but Ulysses was overcome as he heard him, and his cheeks were wet with tears. He wept as a woman weeps when she throws herself on the body of her husband, who has fallen before his own city and people, fighting bravely in defense of his home and children. She screams aloud and flings her arms about him as he lies gasping for breath and dying, but her enemies beat her from behind about the back and shoulders and carry her off into slavery, to a life of labor and sorrow, and the beauty fades from her cheeks. Even so piteously did Ulysses weep, but none of those present perceived his tears except Alcinous, who was sitting near him, and could hear the sobs and sighs that he was heaving. The king therefore at once rose and said, Aldermen and town councillors of the Phoeacians, let Demodocus cease his song, for there are those present who do not seem to like it. From the moment that we have done supper and Demodocus began to sing, our guest has been all the time groaning and lamenting. He is evidently in great trouble, so let the bard leave off, that we may all enjoy ourselves, hosts and guests alike. And this will be much as it should be, for all these festivities, with the escort and the presents that we are making with so much good will, are wholly in his honor, and any one with even a moderate amount of right feeling knows that he ought to treat a guest and a suppliant as though he were his own brother. Therefore, sir, do not on your part affect no more concealment, nor reserve in the matter about which I am about to ask you. It will be more polite in you to give me a plain answer. Tell me the name by which your father and mother over yonder used to call you, by which you were known among your neighbors and fellow citizens. There was no one, neither rich nor poor, who was absolutely without any name whatever. For people's fathers and mothers give them names as soon as they are born. Tell me also your country, nation, and city, that our ships may shape their purpose accordingly and take you there. For the Phaeacians have no pilots, their vessels have no rudders, as those of other nations have, but the ships themselves understand what it is we are thinking about and want. They know all the cities and countries in the whole world, and can traverse the sea just as well, even when it is covered with mist and cloud, so there is no danger of being wrecked or coming to any harm. Still, I do not remember hearing my father say that Neptune was angry with us for being too easy going in the matter of giving people escorts. He said that one of these days he would wreck a ship of ours as it was returning from having escorted someone and bury our city under a high mountain. This is what my father used to say, but whether the god will carry out his threat or no is a matter which he will decide for himself. And now tell me, and tell me true, where have you been wandering? And in what countries have you traveled? Tell us of the peoples themselves, and of their cities. Who were hostile, savage, and uncivilized? And who, on the other hand, hospitable and humane? Tell us also why you are made so unhappy on hearing about the return of the Argive Danaeans in Troy. The gods arranged all this, and sent them their misfortunes, in order that future generations might have something to sing about. Did you lose some brave kinsmen of your wives when you were before Troy? A son-in-law or father-in-law, which are the nearest relations a man has outside his own flesh and blood? Or was it some brave and kindly-natured comrade? For a good friend is as dear to a man as his own brother. End of Book 8